Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Act of Pop Life podcast. My name is Thomas Lee, and I'm joined by my co hosts, Jay Plumbala and Jack Powell. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking all about conservatism, what it is, uh, how we define it, how we look at it in both the past and the present. So, to begin with, I thought I'd lay um, some base definitions down, kind of give us an area, like trying to understand conservatism. So, conservatism as a movement has its um, uh, beginnings in uh, lots of different areas. And I'll let Jay go into more into detail about the exact history of conservatism. Though I, won't, I won't steal your thunder from you just yet. As wow. is tradition, Jay will be doing the history. Um, so we're looking at uh, like a post-enlightenment theory here. Like it's more of a response to like um, other um, post, uh, post-enlightenment theories like uh, liberalism, for example. It appeals to um, tradition and uh, criticizes like other theories of the age, mostly for being too idealistic. It's a response to the ideas at the time, uh, attempting to conserve what um, some believe being um, lost in the wake of progress. We're looking uh, mainly at uh, thinkers like Burke, and um, when it comes to conservatism, we're also looking, uh, the other word that's very intertwined of conservatism is Tory, as it's now used as the insult, as it was back then, the insult. pejorative. Hey, I think I'm right in saying it's Tory's pretty much thrown out, well, slung by some people as an insult, I think would be fair. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. So it's um, the two terms uh, kind of linked. And um, so we have Burke talking as in a response to the French Revolution about um, how this progress of, I won't, I won't step on your territory, Jay, I'll leave the French Revolution alone. You can talk about that more. But the problem being, uh, in the wake of progress, what is lost? And how do we decide what traditions to keep? How do we decide what we need to um, move past and move away from? Um, so to this end, conservatism, a lot of people see as like a reactionary philosophy, a reactionary ideology, which focuses on reacting to um, progress being made and attempting to conserve things. But the issue usually arises in what do we need to conserve? Because of this um, basis on um, almost like a removal of individual freedom to an extent, we, um, this theory tends to be a bit more paternalistic in its nature because individual freedom in like, the liberal sense is lessened in order to preserve a status quo for the perceived benefit of society. There we go. That's, um, that's a Bravo. nice little overview I'm giving of uh, conservatism. I think that's the best I've spoken all in week. Uh, so before we get on to the future and uh, the present with Jack, we'll uh, throw it to the history with Jay. Okay. So as you mentioned, Jack, uh, Tom, 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 <laughs> yep. not, yeah, Jack, shout out for that. Um, Edmund Burke is the father of conservatism, or is it kind of thought to be the modern father of conservatism? Uh, some people claim that like Aristotle and Cicero are the forebearers, but yep. most people know that Edmund Burke was the, was the father. So... <clears throat> He was an Irish statesman and he talked a lot about, as you talk about, as you say, the revolutions in France and his book, uh, Reflection sur les Revolutions en France, or Reflection oh, yeah. on the Revolution in France. This is quite strange for Edmund Burke because people usually think, oh, he must be a Tory. He wasn't a Tory, he was a Whig politician. So this was his, so this was his first uh, kind of, not his first, but his, his most notable work kind of showed him to be a Tory when in reality he was a Whig. Yeah. So Whig being kind of liberal at this point. Um, so he charged the revolutionaries. He said, you're destroying these time-tested institutions without any insurance they could be replaced any better. And he struggled with this kind of rational, uh, the, 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 the contempt that these people had for the past. Uh, so this is a question that I think we can open out to everyone. Yeah. Um, about history kind of does just history necessarily invoke conservative ideals do you think jack uh, you know i i really don't think so um uh in line with keeping tr traditions we see many uh oh if i remember i watched a video by a um i i don't know what right he is no no but he always talks about uh, like um like city planning but he talked about like how um like how state schools often teach a very positive view of like society and their culture as a whole to like try and instill a uh, conservative view of the um society they live in. So yeah. he, was he was talking about how in Hungary, uh, uh, the coming of the seven tribes into the Carpathian Basin is is held as like seven great leaders who settled in this great place and then went on a walk around the entirety of Europe for a few years. And he then talked about 
what actually happened where, you know, mass killing, mass robbing, basically destroying the entirety of Europe, like the Mongols did to them years later. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think history tends towards a conservative view because you start to realise that these institutions which you've, which you've held there aren't really good. It's only good because of how they've been taught to you. That's, a, that's an interesting point because I guess there's a lot of space for like Marxist interpretations of history, but also it might be suggested that viewing just your whole career looking at the past could be it's viewed because, as it, conservative, <laughs> focusing on tradition and stuff like that. Anyway, so he he did this thing, um, he wrote this, and everyone was like, "Wow, we all kind of agree with you, Edmund." And so yeah, he had these ideas, and then later on we have Maestro. Who's a, who's a French, who's a French uh, statesman. And he also had these disagreements about the French Revolution. Um, so he believed in traditional authority, whilst Burke believed in um, constitutional constitutionalism. So right. whilst Burke believed that there should be a parliamentary um, authority, uh, Maestro believed there should be a kind of a full um, authority of either the church or state. And then we have British conservatism. We the names that we start to associate kind of uh, Disraeli and Churchill later on. Mm -hmm. So during the 17th and 18th century, there was the Tory party. So this, it was, it was originally called the Tory party. That's why it was originally called the Tory party. And it was, it was, it represented like the gentry, the established merchant classes and the clergy. Uh, then later on, it, around uh, 1874, it started to finally um, kind of call themselves the conservative party. Uh, the great, great power, and then we had Benjamin Disraeli, who's this really famous politician now, kind of a big statue up in Parliament Square. And um, he nurtured the party's support by basically extending the franchise of votes to the working classes, right? And this is where we have the, the working classes started now. And we, we see the working classes now voting for the Tory party. And yeah. this is what, what feels quite alien to a lot of people, like, well, why? What, what, what motivates these people who are kind of living? A lot of them are living in kind of unspeakable poverty. Why would they vote for this party whose who's kind of main incentive is to, what supposed main incentive anyway, is to, to make the, the rich richer. So anyway, later on, he, he creates this idea of Tory democracy. And then we have Sir Arthur Balfour, who led the Conservative Party in the early start of the 20th century. And the main points here are a kind of imperialism, keeping the empire intact, high tariffs, and the and then during this time, we had the gradual erosion of the working class vote as the Labour Party came in and as the Liberal Party gained more steam. And then we have the First World War. Wow, what a war. The four great imperial dynasties of Europe, Russia, Austria, Hungary, Germany and the Ottoman Empire start to crumble and fall. The last major powers kind of landed democracy, established church are disappearing. Conservative part, and then we have what do Conservative parties come after in this post-war period in the 1920s and 30s? Well, they become the stand bearers for this frustrated nationalism that's occupying the entirety of Europe. And nowhere else does this nationalism take more steed than in the, than in the darkest, the, the darkest crevice of 1930s Germany with the totalitarian regime spreading across Europe destroying some conservative parties but co-opting others then when they are defeated by the conservative party of winston churchill in 1945 although strength of conservative parties does decrease particularly in eastern europe now we have the kind of soviet powers spreading out and, and controlling controlling um um eastern europe um conservatism gets more steam and then and then, and then, the more people think, ah, socialism it has an apparent in inability to kind of rebuild itself, rebuild economies, yeah. and uh, this new libertarian conservatism takes place. And there's we're shunning the old aristocratic associations with conservatism, and we're raising living standards, Jack. We're raising living living standards through the market economy and the provision of wide wide array of social service by the state. Okay, and finally, final. Finally. In this grand tour, this tour de force of conservatism, we end with Margaret Thatcher and her wave of Thatcherism that spread across the world with Reagan later on. Okay, the three decades 
three decades of this era of liberal conservatism came to an end with the neoliberal thoughts of Margaret Thatcher. Those to our listeners who don't know much about neoliberalism, we've talked about it in our liberalism podcast, so I'll yep. encourage you to go and watch that. But if you don't know, it's basically this idea of laissez-faire, stepping back and letting, letting it work, and these old ideas of Adam Smith coming back. Okay, it wasn't just this. It wasn't just laissez-faire economy. She had a strident anti-communism to her. And she she, um, she declared there is no such thing as a society. Now, by a society, she meant that society was nothing more than a collection of individuals. Uh, we see this kind of, this is much more in common with the view of Burke way back when. And then we have the later Tory parties of David Cameron and Theresa May and now Boris Johnson that are perhaps less extreme. And particularly Boris Johnson perhaps work more of a populist appeal. Uh, which could be argued to be kind of a downfall of conservatism. I hope you've enjoyed my um, histronic and uh, melodramatic tour of um, of conservatism. I thought it got particularly um, exciting during the 1930s. I, I, I kind of took that into my stride. Particularly uh, exciting, Jay. Do you mind uh, going into that a bit further? I feel like this is like, um, like a build-up to a joke where you call the uh, the current prime minister or draw likenesses between the current prime minister and a prime uh, and a uh, uh, other words say the word they call them um how how many years ago 110 no uh 70 years Jackie, ago okay having a stroke <laughs> yeah so can we hear the modern modern take now from jack or unless there's any yeah. comments to my Amazing I, history. Before, before I let, before I, before we let Jack <laughs> loose, before we, before we let loose the gates and of um, the Economist, um, the economist I would like grunts like, uh, like uh, so, you get your, uh, your pillows ready. So we're looking at Burke talking about these um, liberal, like if we go back to the, towards the beginning, we're looking at Burke talking about these liberal ideas as like this, as like idealism, and like he can see, he says you can. You know, you see that French Revolution, you've got like this, um, like you know, power to the people, this uprising, and then what does it lead to? Well, we got, we got, you know, another like four republics later, and um, you know, France was like, you know, in this constant state of turmoil after the first revolution. I think it'd be fair to say, and then Napoleon sweeps in, so on and so forth. So, from that, could you say, would you, um, actually, here's a question: uh, the French Revolution was it? A demonstrable failure or a success in igniting this um, like class consciousness within the, within the people, and did it like do more for liberalism or conservatism? I think it's important to view the French Revolution as not like one set thing. It was more of a process. Yeah. So we had like a number of number of set. I'm trying to think. I, I did a lot of reading on the French Revolution way like before before the first lockdown, and then I, it just disappeared. So it started. There's a number of reasons why. It, Started. This isn't a history lesson, but I'll try and talk over them quickly. So, it was the there was the um, the Seven Years' War, which kind of crippled it. There was the failure in harvest, and there was also the the whole issue with um, the set parties in France, um, and it failed. The the, the first of it kind of, it's it's tricky. I can't, I can't talk about it quickly because it's it's a really tricky bit of history. As I say, it's a kind of a process with these set revolutions, and then you talk about the kind of the the the, the, um, the sweeping in of Napoleon. And the, and the and the wars that followed that, but what was what was your question again? Um, Do you so like if we look at the French Revolution here as in like Burke's eyes as like showing like failings of like these new uh, post Enlightenment philosophies, and we look at it also like um, how like it ignited this idea of conservatism. Do you think the French Revolution did more for liberalism or conservatism as a movement? What do you think it bolstered? Yeah, because because yeah, because as you say, it's a it is a reaction to the nationalist yeah uh, the, the 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 rationalist um nature of uh, liberalism i don't know jack yeah well um if we're looking at the uh the french revolution and um whether it was good or not whilst i can't think too much of the politics of it uh, but from a purely utilitarian point of view uh, there are many uh, yeah i know uh, not liberal controversial uh there were many points where it went went wrong. One being that the um, there was no centralized government to really build the infrastructure that that was made available by the Industrial Revolution. Of course, the uh, the French Revolution uh, was uh, was in around the same period as the Industrial Revolution. Am I correct in saying that, Jay? Uh, there was a number of them. So you say yeah, the yeah, French Revolution. Yeah. The, the first French Revolution was seventeen ninety. So 1790. kind of thinking around. 
Yeah. Um, right track. The Industrial Revolution was kind of mid to late Victorian era, wasn't it? Yeah, but the but the consequence of it consequences of it meant there was no national authority to build the infrastructure like canals, trains, railways, yeah. because there was personal property. And from a purely u- utilitarian point of view, this set France back a lot. France before the revolution was a massive powerhouse. Then Napoleon came along, was still a powerhouse. But in a you know World War One, France was France was on the on on the back foot. World War Two, France was definitely on the back foot, practically falling apart. I disagree with it being a powerhouse before the French Revolution. Like, wasn't like ninety percent of the population was illiterate. Yeah, but there was a lot of them. There was like hey, everyone was illiterate back then. It's the seventeen yeah. hundred. Yeah, it was considerably worse than most European countries. Yeah, but right. France that's why there was a revolution. If we still like as a military force, would you? Be like more we're talking <laughs> about history. Tell me off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, guess, I guess it goes. In. They're intertwined. So, shall we talk about the working classes for a bit before we get, before we get, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> before we, before we get into the before we get into the uh, from a, the the, um, the modern the modern. All right, Jack, give us the future. Right, so uh, I'm going to talk about a thing called um, fiscal conser- conservatism. Is it conservatism or conservatism? I might be saying the wrong one. Flip a coin. Right. Conservatism. I've said conservatism. Right. It's conservatism. It's conservatism. I'm telling you, there's no good of the coin. Fiscal, fiscal conservatism. This is the idea that uh, debt should not be accrued by the government and placed on the taxpayer. Uh, I think Edmund Burke talked about that one. Uh, hence, where the name fiscal conservatism comes from. Uh, however, it didn't used to be like that. This was a offshoot off off of the uh, classic liberals in the 1930s. These so-called classic liberals changed themselves to fiscal conservatives. Uh, due to the um, how the how the New Deal augmented the I wonder what happened in the thirties. <laughs> the um, the uh, the New Deal changed the uh, view of what a liberal was. So whilst a liberal back in the day was uh, low taxes, uh, less government control, a liberal past the nineteen thirties was um, more like social welfare and stuff like that. So these so these classic liberals split off to become fiscal conservatives. These guys believed in low tax and a balanced budget i believe uh one of the bloombergs the one who was a mayor of new york talked about uh the definition of a conservative or a fiscal conservative is someone that balances the books and then lowers taxes after if they can now conservatism really made its peak uh, during a period of um or called the uh the stagflation this is a very interesting time wherein inflation soared to massively high levels. I believe it, in the UK, it hit a peak of 18%. That means 18% of your money has just gone away in the year, basically. The And then unemployment was really high as well, 10%. Now, this is a big, or was a big controversy because <clears throat> it was... Was this, sorry, was this um, 70s? Uh, 1971, I believe it started... And then it continued right. on with uh, Margaret Thatcher's response to it, and then Reagan's. Was this to who's it. who's who would be? Was it Edward Heath or and then and then Ted? No, Ted. Ted. Yeah, Ted Heath. I think so. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay, he came in seventy. Mm-hmm. Checking my trusted ruler of British Prime Ministers. <laughs> so, <laughs> this this stagflation was caused by a uh, numerous factors. Uh, one mainly being the uh, oil crisis. Now, uh, I, I assume most of you are aware of a uh, supply and demand diagram. If not, there's basically two di- uh, diagonal lines. The downward sloping one is demand. The upward sloping one is supply. The left axis Slow down price. here, Jack. What's a diagonal? Um, a, a, a line Slow down here, Jack. What's a graph? With gradient uh, a half or minus a half. Thank you. If- you carry on. Yeah. So uh, yeah, nah. with the with the left axis being price and the and the bottom axis being uh, quantity supplied, so the so the oil crisis uh, restricted the supply of petroleum, which is a very widely used good or thing used in the production of stuff. So supply was effectively decreased, that raised prices. However, it also led on to a decreasing unemployment because these businesses could no longer afford to pay 
workers. However, this kept on multiplying for some reason. Now, later economist Milton Friedman uh, said... Woo woo. Yeah. <laughs> Milton Friedman comes into this. So Milton Friedman said, I'm going to paraphrase it to make it easier, but imagine you're a employer for the past... Uh, you're a you're a employee sitting on the table with your with your future employer and you're talking about your wage. So for the past three years there's been a rather high rate of inflation. You're gonna take this inflation into account with your wage. So you'll inflate your wage. Now imagine everyone does this. So everyone inflates their wage, but so so all these workers have tons of money. Demand increases by a lot. But hold on. This firm is still only employing the same amount of people or perhaps even less because it's paying more. So supply either, either stays where it is or shifts to the left. Now, this increases inflation again. And it happens again. And it happens again. So, so there's a massive kind of a wave of unemployment yeah. and inflation. Now, Reagan dealt with this by spending a lot decreasing taxes a lot i believe in the top blaming market. black people that was more of a uh, a side hobby jay that was like his this <laughs> <laughs> big thing is the welfare queen to kind yeah. of blame reagan he did blame the people for it but you know um, so how, how do you think this so you're, you're saying this kind of stagflation was a result of conservatism no i'm saying it it really spurred conservative policy uh, it's what made people choose conservatives because uh, right. it's it's what really kicked out the conservative because the two heavy hitters of this period were Reagan and Thatcher. Thatcher mm-hmm. caused, ma- caused, caused widespread unemployment to combat this. She actually raised taxes. So, yeah. I don't know. I okay, so, what, what about, um, why don't we consider kind of working class uh, Tories? For a second, or more, in a, if you want. To. In what way? What do you? Um... Well, some people view it as quite paradoxical. Uh, well, well, yeah, I suppose. I suppose, an extent, you could say, uh, as, as like really basic, uh, the conservative, the conservative government, the cons- a conservative system is one which benefits um, those of a higher class, as they conserve tradition and keep things in the same social standing and status quo, etc. Whereas a liberal um, my liberal idea would be more likely to raise people out of it, ergo welfare state. But then so again, a, that's still kind of keeping tradition. So the socialist is the one that kind of rejects tradition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like on like on like um, a base level, that's why you could probably like point to it as paradoxical. But I suppose what happened, what um, I think you get a lot of people who um look at like our like supposedly supposed meritocracy and think I uh, like in like in like a any like conservative like um. I'm going to say the word regime, not because I think it's a regime, but because like I like the other words escape me. And this like um like people think, oh, I can do it too. We're in a meritocracy, and any failings would would be like my fault. Or it's a bit of a class consciousness divide where people don't see themselves as part of them, a class they may be part of because they see themselves as one of the winners. When in reality, like in comparison to the most well off, the one of the losers of this um, uh, I'm going to say regime again. Don't think the it's race. a regime. Just going to yeah. Paraphrase. Anyway. Yeah, that that that'd be like that's my way of looking at it. I think so a lot kind of, of the American it, dream, kind of falsehood. Oh, I can yeah. make it if I try. Exactly, that'd be my go-to. I think people have this um, idealism again. Funnily enough, I'm gonna I think it's I'm, ignorance. Yeah, personally, I th- um ignorance, but maybe not for a la- not for a lack of trying, but for a lack of it because it. You know, you don't want to think that you're like you know, down on your luck, and you've got a and you've got a raw deal at the end of the day because that's not a good feeling to feel. People want to imagine that the government they're currently in would benefit them more than it would hinder them. I, I would, I would like, I think. Who has the I think energy? It might be a lack of education contributes to that. Possibly, I would. I, I think you could definitely say a lack of a political education could lead to that. A lack of an understanding of your class consciousness, possibly. I would say um, as well. Uh, Jay, stall for me whilst I try on my point. Uh, well, uh, uh, hold on. Jack, stall for you there, Tom. With a bit of a, thank you, Jack. Uh, with a bit of a uh, objection as well. Um, you're saying oh. that uh, the, these people uh, want to go to the past, but the past is bad because they get a a, a worse deal. Uh, well, actually, in the past, uh, things were much more equal. Uh, before Thatcher came along, 
society was a lot more equal than it was today. Uh, in terms of pure Gini coefficient, we are at around the same Gini coefficient uh, as we were in World War II. Uh, so post-World War II, there was a massive period of uh, basically socialism in the uh, the UK. It was hardly utopia, was it? Well, but it was a lot better than it was now. We're talking like, there was like uh, a 10%. Yeah, but these, the, 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 these governing powers that created this, this utopian sense post-war were socialist powers yes but but maybe the modern day conservatives want to revisit a time when government debt didn't equal their gdp when uh you know there wasn't financial crises uh surely if they wanted this they'd they'd vote for the labor party well because they just want it back how it was. They don't want to Wait, it, it was how it... The time you're describing was a time when Labour were in power. Yeah. So why would they Why would they want to go back to them and then vote for the opposite party? No, they don't want to go back to them. They're now, and they want to go back. And I think, again... These, um... these, these, these Conservatives saying, oh, we're going to keep, keep the values our country has. And they're like, oh, yeah, change has been bad for us, you know. 2008 financial crisis well it did happen through history it's more fresher in everyone's minds now i wouldn't i personally accuse said conservatives themselves of being the idealistic ones in comparison to the um quote-unquote liberals of who are like have this like, idealistic quote-unquote utopian view because it, it tends to be in the case of a someone like uh reagan what Reagan invoked was, um, if I'm, please correct me if I'm mistaken, was like was like an I- I- ideal time of the fifties, right? He looked to that, like I, I swear, like that. Well, I swear he looked. Radicalism, yeah, yeah. This kind of like, oh, remember how great we were just after post war? Like, remember, like this idea of, of going so many years back to a point where people don't really remember the past properly, and invoking the nostalgia, that plays in. yeah, the, the the play to nostalgia, the play to populism, and like. Jay just said um, those governments a lot of the time would tend to be more liberal or labor, but that doesn't really matter because what uh, these uh, governments are trying to do is play in people's nostalgia to get in power as opposed to um, do what was done in the past. I would probably say that a lot of conservative governments, especially in the Thatcher's case, like Thatcher didn't conserve tradition per se, did she? She came out with like, like all things considered, she did things that people hadn't done before, or at least did things that. Yeah, I keep, think she, 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 she's deeply religious, though. Yeah, like, yeah. Look, look, again, the difference but that between... Didn't, that didn't get involved in the politics. Or at least she tried it not to. Yeah, I think like there's a difference here between like a, a socially conservative, but possibly like, what, like you know, uh, economically not progressive, but like economically different and changing. Because, yeah, I think as well, there's obviously this um, large um, dichotomy between, like, say, like, someone who can be, like, very, on a social axis, very conservative, while on an economic axis, a lot more liberal and open-minded. You're, like, you know, neocon, possibly. Um, Jack, was there any, what else, was there anything else you wanted to add when you were talking about the history? Or talking the history, the future, even? Uh, I don't think so. Did we hold the main points? Uh, I think so. I have a bad memory, though. So You only talked about stagflation in the 70s, not much about yeah, the future. yeah. That's because the future is just what it is. Boris Johnson is barely a conservative. He's just a, a populist mouthpiece. Wow. The trait. I mean, hold on. What is he conserving except for like the cronyism of his part, his own party? Is, is that not it? Is that wrong? Is that well, not I mean, I'm, maybe. But then again, am I, am I a conservative? For wanting Tom to not eat my Oreos, are you going to call me a Tom what? in the street? <laughs> Little Tom, eh? <laughs> Eating his Oreos. Oh, God. I'm pretty sure they're my Oreos anyway. No, oh, no, Tom. When you uh, when you passed them out, you uh, forgo your property rights. Well, then they also weren't yours, and I didn't eat any of yours if I gave them to you. Okay, Tom. I'm glad we cleared this up, cleared up the Oreo dilemma. So, Have we got any closing statements? Talk about- Bit about Labour and conservatism right. now. Right. What is this kind of? What is this? What is this? This. Um, it seems to be that Labour is very unpopular, and it's the truth that the Conservative Party at the moment have more popularity than Labour. Um, Why? Labour's red, Conservatives are blue, 
I don't think there's anything different between I the think, two of them. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's true. If we're looking at Keir Starmer and his um, like uh, basically abolition of um, Corbyn, Corbynism as a whole, not that I personally like the biggest fan of Corbyn, per- I, I'm not, but what I mean to say is, you know, like there's definitely like this like severing off of um, a more like quote unquote radical liberal and then uh, moving to more of a centre, which seems to be what both parties, or at least what uh, Labour is doing to an extent, is it's centering itself a lot more than the Conservative Party. But the Conservative Party is like meant to be a socialist party. It's not meant to be a liberalist party. It's not meant to be a liberal party. That's the liberal and the late liberal. Yeah, Democrat. the Labour Party, you mean, I'm assuming. Yeah. No, yeah. The Labour, sorry, the Labour Party is a socialist party, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. meant to be. Well, well, yeah, it was meant to be, but we have this issue where, like, this needs to be a to the like, right. Yeah. It's funny how we see Clement Attlee use the word socialist, like, when he's in office, and no one really objects, and now it's, you said, like, all oh, this, this, this politician socialist is like, oh, my God, he's socialist. We can't have a socialist running our country. Oh, my God. I mean, I mean, that's um, the red scare for you, isn't it? That's um, the use of that word as, like, this, like, scary thing in the past that people associate with Stalin's as In the 40s, it was fine. He used it, he used it loads. Yeah. But well, that's before, that's pre-Cold War, or at least the Cold Wars, you know, not... Yeah, yeah. America part. still had an aversion to Soviet yeah, socialism but, in the 40s. Yeah but, they, yeah, but then, like, McCarthy. Yeah, but, yeah, but that was... Uh, there was two red waves. One was in the 20s, and then McCarthy was just 10 years later. But Harold Wilson was a prime minister in the 60s, and he said he was a socialist, and people were fine with that. Yeah. Did Thatcher do it? Did Thatcher take some... Yeah. <laughs> Can we blame think... Mr. Thatcher? Can we pin something else on Thatcher? I think, like, uh, post... Thatcherist Britain led to a, a massive rise in like this uh, ethical egoism where it's like um, yeah. the idea that only you matter. And we can see this today with like almost what the Tories have done. Uh, like, like socially, like if you ask someone, oh, do you want to help this person? Uh, like like uh, in the news, you see, them, you see them talking to people and instead of helping someone because they're like down and they're like just someone there, it's usually, oh, they're trying to take something away from me, you know. And it's like this, um, this like... Um, the focus on what you have to lose rather than what others have to gain. Yeah. So, yeah, and this is what Tony Blair, it worked, you know. This this kind of thing, this propaganda worked. And then Tony Blair was like, right, let's take it and then twist it a red way. And that's what he did in 1997. And then he became leader because it, cause he realised that he that's the way to capture the middle classes, which were becoming the largest kind of yeah. majority of the franchise. Yeah. I think that's um, a really nice, depressing note to end um, today's podcast on. If anyone else has anything else to add before we wrap it all up. Yes. Okay. Next week, we will be doing a very exciting podcast with another guest. Yes, we will. One that we've delayed. But he's here now. And he's ready. Accidentally. We're going to go. It's going to be on. Uh, we, we we're not quite sure yet. So we're going to give you a surprise. It could either be on just a nice absurdism, track. Camus and, and absurdism, or it could be on um, environmentalism. So see you next week. Goodbye. See you next week.